including choir people. We are so happy to have you tonight. It's a lovely um, opportunity to see some new faces or some old faces that we remember. And uh, we're grateful you're here. I wanted to point out to you that next week is winter break. The paper you have in your hands, if you picked it up here, says that next week we're meeting, but we're not. We missed that piece, so we're, next week is winter break. The following week is first and foremost, so it will be March the 8th when we meet again. So our next oh, Esther no. meeting will be March the 8th. Yeah. It feels like forever, so enjoy tonight a lot. Because <laughs> you're going to have to let us hold you for now. Um, Sandy isn't feeling good, but she is back. She was in San Diego with her grandchild and her family. She's back. She came in yesterday, but she just isn't feeling great, so she's not here tonight, but I realized um, I didn't tell you where she was last week, so I didn't want you to worry that she wasn't here. Um, we're looking forward to what God's going to do, and let's pray and get started. Father, thank you so much for this day and for all that you do. <coughs> Father, we're just grateful for this moment, this time where we can stop and just really focus. God, we thank you for the stories you give us in your word that are meant to teach us, to grow, to trust you, and to see what you said you're at work, even when we can't see. God, we love you so much, and we pray that you'll give Karen every single word that she could say, and that you would bless our learning and our teaching and our discussions tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all know that I am not a native Georgian. I grew up in North Carolina, and I love North Carolina for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons that I like North Carolina is because it actually has four seasons. It has definitely has <laughs> summer, it has fall and spring, but it also has winter. And so I could count on two or three really decent snows. It's not like way up north where you got it up to your, your hip, and it stays for months and months and months. But it was just enough to enjoy it. In fact, here's a picture of me and my brother in the backyard here. Now, that is not, don't, don't be fooled by this, okay? <laughs> he just hit me in the face with a snowball and is trying to get, his, get mom from <laughs> not, not, not fussing at him. So, But that's me, my brother and I in our backyard full of snow there. And the house I grew up on here was on a gravel road. It was on a circle with about 15 houses on it or so. Uh, you know, it was not a lot of traffic on it. And so when we had snow, uh, my dad would get out of his truck and he would go up and down the hills. And our house was kind of at the bottom of two of those two hills. So he would go up and down and pack down the snow and then we'd get our sleds and we would go sliding down, careening down this hill, having a great time. Now, uh, it wasn't enough for us to just sled down the hill because we got bored with that pretty quickly. So we would uh, come careening down and then we would veer off the side of the road and there was embankments on both sides <laughs> so we would go go down there and so we would just 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 down this steep, steep embankment down just to kind of get the double fun and so I was telling my kids about that one time when we were on my way uh, down that road and I was telling a story about it and you know it dawned on me I was like you know that was probably not a great idea <laughs> that was a little dangerous maybe because there was a creek at the bottom we could have gone into the creek there's any number of trees because it was very wooded and you know any number of things you could have impaled yourself into so it's just not a great idea but as I was telling my kids that right it was like my, your perspective changes when you get to be older right <laughs> it's like because I mean when we grew up we have more life experience we see kind of some of the things that can happen and we become maybe a little more cautious for good reason. And now that thing in us as we grow up that makes us not make those crazy childish decisions also can be the same thing in us as we grow up that kind of stops us from being bold and courageous in our faith uh, and our dedication to God. Because we start factoring in all the possible things that could happen and all the scenarios that might happen. And it stirs up a lot of fear inside of us and makes us hesitate and to hesitate to step out and trust God when he's calling us to do something. That's a little scary. So um, we have to use wisdom in our decision making, of course. The whole book of Proverbs talks us about the importance of wisdom. But we also don't need to let fear be the final and the loudest voices in our head that helps us in making decisions to follow God. Because as the days become darker in the world that we live in, as they will, 
Um, we are going to see a lot more hanging in the balance of living lives that are faithful to God. And oftentimes that's going to require us to exhibit courage and be willing to stand up for Christ, even in the face of things that might cause us a lot of risk. And so that's what we're really going to talk about tonight in Esther chapter 4. And if you'll remember last time, if you were here, we met Haman last time. And he's he uh, was elevated by Xerxes to the second most powerful position as his advisor. And he uh, was a, um, an Amalekite. And the Amalekites and the Jews have a long history of hatred that went all the way back to the book of Exodus. And we saw how that related to uh, Mordecai because Mordecai... Uh, the Holy Land, was, uh, especially the city of Susa, was called to honor Haman and bow down when he went by. When Mordecai's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that because I don't bow to anybody but God because it says in the scripture, in the last, uh, in, uh, in there, that it was because he was a Jew that he wouldn't bow. And so this enraged Haman, and, and so when he found out that Mordecai wouldn't, wouldn't bow to him, instead of just uh, getting rid of Mordecai, he hatched this evil plot to get rid of the entire uh, Jewish nation from one side of Persia to the other. And so, uh, he, t so he, so that he issues this edict. We find out that he he took uh, all all this time, called on his uh, div diviners, and they 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 um, cast lots over the course of the year to figure out the best day that they could do this, which was 11 months from the time that the edict was uh, put out. And so yeah, um, he manipulated Xerxes into uh, signing on with the deal. Xerxes basically said, I don't care, do whatever you want to. Gave him his signet ring, said you can just pass the, the uh, edict. And with that signet ring, it was a law just as in effect as if Xerxes himself had written it. So anyway, we get up to there that once uh, the edict is is uh, sent out through the land, the uh, the responses, of course, everybody, uh, the, all the Jews kind of freak out. And that's where we are up to Esther chapter 4, verse 1. Mordecai learned of all that had been done by Haman. He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. Now, this action of tearing clothes and sackcloth and ashes was familiar Old Testament uh, action for deep mourning and distress. So we have uh, examples of Joshua and Caleb when they tore their clothes, when the people wanted to go back to Egypt. David tore his clothes on more than one occasion, including at the death of Saul. The prophet Ezra tore his clothes when the people began to intermarry with the pagan people around them. And uh, even the Persians did sackcloth and ashes when they were in distress over losing the war with the Greeks that we learned about a few weeks ago. So, verse 3, there's not just Mordecai upset, but in every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. But... Apparently, the only one that doesn't really know what's going on is Esther because she hears that Mordecai is in mourning and she doesn't understand what's happening specifically because in verse 4 it says she, when she finds out about Mordecai, she was in great distress and sent clothes for him to put on instead of a set cloth and ashes, but he wouldn't accept it. So she's like, what's up with you? And um, she doesn't really know what's going on. So she starts working to find out what's happening by summoning her attendant, Haddock. So it says right here that she summoned Haddock, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So she goes on this campaign, figure out what's going on. Now, if you read this this week, you'll see that there was a lot of back and forth between Esther and Mordecai with Haddock as the go-between. Now, if this had been in our day, what you had been reading in, fourth, in the fourth chapter is basically a text message exchange and so for fun <laughs> let's just say that esther picks up her persian phone the haddock 1.0 and it says hey siri or hey samaria samaria <laughs> text mordecai and so we got here heard you're upset what's up right now and you can follow along on the back of your sheet these are just pair of my fair phrases my text message parish phrases of what's actually what says in scripture but so she, she asks Haman, what's up? And he says, Haman, he bribed Xerxes with 3,000 tons of silver to get him to eliminate all of our people. That's in verse 7. And Esther replies back, I don't know what you're talking 
about what happened. Verse 8. So Mordecai takes a picture of the, of the <laughs> text it to her, and she looks at it and then replies. This is urgent, my dear Esther. You must go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for your people. Now, I said this last week. This is five years into Esther's marriage to Xerxes. And the initial instruction to Mordecai to Esther way back when she first showed up at the palace was don't tell anybody about your Jewish heritage. Um, and he, so, and he's apparently told her to keep that up the whole time she's been queen. And But now he changes what he... Telling her and says, "Stop! You got to tell him. Tell him what's going on here. You are positioned to go in there and plead for our people." So this freaks her out just a little bit because the relationship between Xerxes and Esther is completely one-sided. This is not anything like a traditional marriage that we would think about today, where you know they sat around and had dinner together and they did things. To, and he asked her advice about stuff, and they just hung out together. That's not the way it was. She existed for his pleasure. He called her. She came when he, when he called. She left when he said go. That's the way it was. So she's a little bit freaked out <laughs> and says to him, no way. You know that will mean death for me, right? No one can go to the king without being summoned. Verse 11. And she wasn't just allowed to go in and say hi. There were only seven advisors who were positioned around the king who were allowed free access to him like that. In this case, Haman was one of those. Uh, everyone else was forbidden under penalty of death to come into the king's presence. And the normal protocol, if somebody wanted to go see the king, was to approach one of these seven advisors and tell them what you wanted to see the king about. Then the advisor would take the message to the king and then he would de de decide whether you could come or not. Might be yes, might be no, might be you never hear back from him at all. So she doesn't want to go through the normal channels for some reason, presumably because she's going to have to explain. She's going to have to, you know, she doesn't want to tip her hand to Haman. She doesn't want to talk to him, so she, and she doesn't want to arouse suspicion. So she would have to explain. So she says to Mordecai, the only way around it is for him to extend the golden scepter. Probably not going to happen since it's been, it's been a month since Xerxes sent for me. So the golden scepter, uh, that this was no law in Persian court about this golden scepter, going back to time way before Xerxes, and here is an actual carving of King Darius, from, uh, and um, you see him sitting there on the throne, and this is the golden scepter right here that he has in his hands. You'll notice that he's flanked by his guards here, and so this the, they were there to execute immediate justice if the king was not happy to see somebody come into his presence. So Esther would have been well aware of this court protocol and what would the consequences would be waiting for her if Xerxes just wasn't in the mood to see her for some reason. We already know how volatile and uh, unpredictable Xerxes is. So if he's not in the right mood, he doesn't really want to talk to his lady at this time, she can be executed without even uh, any conversation at all. So Mordecai replies to her, being the king's wife isn't going to save you. If you don't speak up, our people will be delivered some other way, but everyone you are related to will die. And so he's convinced that her ethnicity is going to be revealed in the process between now and the 11 months when this is carried out by some means, and she's going to be either executed along with everybody else, or if she does survive, Everyone else, including him, is going to be destroyed. So let's break, break away from the text message fun thing a little bit because this is really important. These verses are very important. I want you to see actually what it says here in verse 13. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. So uh, this is a statement of huge faith by Mordecai, right? He sees this threat is real. He knows what can happen. But at the same time, he's not hanging all his hope on Esther, right? He doesn't say relief and deliverance might come or could arise. He says it will arise from another place. And perhaps he has in mind and has remembered what he's been taught, maybe by his family, about uh, what happened between God and Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, where God said to Abraham, in your seed, that is in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
And so in his mind, all the Jews can't be wiped out for that promise to be fulfilled. Maybe he remembers what we read in Genesis chapter 35, where Israel is promised to be a company of nations, and then that a king, the Messiah, would come from the line of David who would rule forever. And so maybe he was believing all of that in spite of the desperate situation that they face right now. Uh, this is a man of great faith who, by the way, grew up and lived in captivity his entire life. Uh, he's never, uh, he, the only time he ever lived in Jerusalem was maybe when he was a tiny little baby, but he's been under the rule of a pagan nation for his entire life, and the, the Jews have not seen a lot of activity of God on their behalf for a very long time, yet he still believes, yet he is still confident, still trusts in the promise of God, even though he doesn't have a lot of evidence to uh, support that. Here's one of the places in this wonderful book that doesn't mention the name of God, but he is surely referencing God as the agent of deliverance and the one who will be the salvation of the Jews. And then he goes on to say, who knows, but for you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. And here is the most well-known phrase in the entire book of Esther, for such a time as this. Even t-shirts have <laughs> come on like mine. Such a great statement from Mordecai to Esther, right? He calls her up out of fear and intimidation and into a greater purpose for her life. Mordecai, who at the beginning of this, uh, this drama with Xerxes was really convinced uh, 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 that, that her well-being was threatened and uh, you know, he was worried about her, so he checks on her every day at the beginning to make sure she's okay, presumably to ensure that something terrible doesn't happen to her and the volatility around the political and social dramas that all went around in the palace. But Esther has been there for five years now. She's not a scared little girl anymore. She's learned a lot about how things are going on. She's not dumb. She's a savvy lady. She knows who the king is and what he's like. So when this crisis happens for, with Haman, Mordecai stops being afraid for Esther and with a new perspective sees this whole situation that led her to the palace you know, five, six years ago as the providential handiwork of God. He now sees how unlikely it is that she would just randomly be the winner of this beauty contest test, and would be raised from poverty to, and obscurity to the queen of Persia. He's seeing God at work at this. And Mordecai can see that this rise to prominence and this influential position that she has ha may be for this singular purpose for such a time as this. And he sees her and sees God working, and instead of enveloping her in a protective little bubble there in order to save her from harm, now he pushes her toward what is a, surely a dangerous situation because he sees the bigger picture. And this becomes the turning point of Esther's life. She hears the word of Mordecai and responds with a resolute conviction. Verse 16, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days. Uh, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. So up until this point, if you've seen how Esther was for, previous to this, this verse right here, she's basically been passive in the story. She has quietly accepted everything that came her way. She took instructions from Xerxes, took instructions from the guards, took instructions from Mordecai. But here, as a result of the new frame that, that Mordecai puts around this, and has given to her story, she begins to act. She stops taking instructions and starts giving instructions. And from this point on in the story, she becomes a shrewd and able player in, in the drama that's unfolding around her. And she takes what she's learned about Xerxes, initiates actions, executes a clever plan to garner his favor, and defeat Haman's plan, as we'll see in the weeks ahead. And before, but before she breaks off this conversation and to enter her three-day fast, uh, uh, but remember now, this is not a fast of mourning like we see in verse 1. This is a fast of, fast of seeking direction and guidance from God. She says this powerful statement right here. She says, when this is done, I'll go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. This is her defining moment. Courage, not compliance, strength. Not fear, 
giving herself to the purposes of God instead of trying to save herself. Willing to be used by God even to the point of death. And the last verse of this chapter says that Mordecai went away, carried out all of Esther's instructions. So he's doing what she suggests now, not the other way around. Definite shift, change in Esther just across this one chapter, these few verses. And so that's where our story ends for tonight. And so once again, we always have to go. What's our application of chapter 4? Because we're not going to just read and, um, and, and just enjoy the story. We want to know what we can take out of our lives that we can put into the, our 21st century lives now. And what we're going to, the truth we're going to apply today is about the defining moments. About defining moments. And that is, we have to learn to look at our lives differently like Esther did. We tend to just think famous people are the ones who are having defining moments. Or these giants of the faith out there, they're the ones that are going to move and shift and change things. That's not the case. This part of the story Esther's moment here to decide to be was to be, decide to be motivated by fear, or to step forward in faith and put her hand self into the hands of God, no matter what happens. And you know we don't often see them see our moments that well because they're not as dramatic as what she she was facing, right? But moments to choose faith over fear happen all. The time. And at this point in the story, she has no idea how it goes. She, and we see, we know, because we get to read the end of the story, but she didn't have any promise that it was going to turn out the way that uh, it did. And uh, we have to be, begin to focus on, hold on a minute, uh, pages are out of order. <laughs> Again, I'm listening to a preach. Sorry. Um, we have, to, we have to learn to focus that, uh, on the fact that God has placed us where we are for a reason. There's something for us to do any time that we come up to these moments when we can be afraid, right? We can step into faith. Um, and he, what he doesn't want us to do is cower in fear and let that be the loudest voice in our head. Um, you know, and you know, sometimes the thing that's the loudest to us is the fear of our past or the fear of opinions of other people or of losing your reputation or worse you know god can take care of all of that if he wants to if we put ourselves in his hands there is something that he has positioned us for, to do right where we are i mean have you ever really stopped to consider that what why god puts you where you are have you really ever thought about that really consider the reality of why he might have put you in the neighborhood or the apartment complex or the house or the family that you were in? Why might have he placed you in the office or the school or the career that you have? Why did he give you the, uh, the abilities that you have for your own self or to serve him in some capacity? Why are you in a place that has a lot of conflict? It's not to be part of it, right? <laughs> We're not supposed to be part of it. He, he has placed you there for himself. And it's uh, not for you to be happy, to mask more and more and more things. He saved you not to spend uh, what he's given you on your pleasures. He has saved you for himself. As we said a few weeks ago, when we saw in Acts chapter 17, it's for you to point him, other people to himself. There will be a, a, a defining moment for you in your life, sometimes more than one, probably more than one. But here's the thing, you don't know which one it is. And so we have to learn to look, instead of looking solely at the fearful situation, we have to learn to look for the opportunities within it, just like Esther did. It's like, yes, it's, there's something scary out there, but we have to learn to look beyond that, get that different framework around what what we're facing, like Mordecai helped her see, is that there's something more going on here. And so, uh, you know, and I go back to that she didn't know. She didn't know what was going to happen, but she stepped into it anyway. And so she said right here, and who knows but that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. 
Mordecai says to Esther, you know, hey, it's possible that this is your moment. The reason that all the last six years have happened, maybe it is. He doesn't know. He's saying, who knows? This might be a possibility here. He's just posing this new idea to her for her to kind of come around and not just respond in fear. He's directing her attention off herself, off of that scary, fearful moment, and on to God. She doesn't know how it's going to happen. She doesn't know what it's going to Gonna, gonna, how it's all going to unfold, but she resigns herself that e I'm going to trust God, I'm going to step out even if I perish. That's a real possibility in this situation. But what's hanging in the balance of her stepping out and, and risking everything is worth what, she, what she's risking. <clears throat> so, the advantage, so we have the advantage of a lot of histories that passed since, um, since Esther, and, and we can see how critical this moment was for her and for, in the life of the Jews. And, but she didn't have any idea that she would be memorialized like she has. And it would be one of the most pivotal moments in God keeping his covenant with Israel. She didn't know at the time. See, she can only see in retrospect. And this is so, so important for us to get because you don't really get insight into which moments are important on the front end. You don't. You only see in retrospect how your faith and obedience work out. Now, of course, if somebody had come to her and said, you know, Esther, okay, let me tell you what's really going on here. Um, you know, this is a, God is going to use this moment right here, the decision you make right here. God's going to use this to preserve the coming of the Messiah. If he, and he's going to use this moment right here to keep his covenant with Abraham. You are so important right here. Uh, and he's going to say, and you know what? This whole thing about Xerxes, don't worry about him. It's nothing to be afraid of. God's going to give him special favor toward you. And it's all going to go well. Of course she steps up. There's no risk, right, if she knows that? But she didn't know. She didn't know. Fear of the unknown could have made her keep quiet and take care of herself. Good chance she gets through this, right? Or maybe not. Xerxes unpredictable. She could have been bucking with a room with in a room with Vashti and just a, a snap of the fingers. But she stepped into this moment, not knowing. The lesson for us today is that defining moments are going to come in your life. You don't know when they're coming. And you don't know that they're defining moments at the moment it happens. You don't know which is your defining moment until on the other side of it. Could be as public as taking a stand for godliness. Might be saying no to something that's wrong, that's not what God says, and you risk being shunned by family or friends, or co-workers. Could be remaining faithful in difficult marriage or contentious family situation or hostile work environment. It might be to offer forgiveness to somebody who hurts you when that seems the very last least reasonable thing to do or being faithful to pray and not give up no matter what it looks like on the outside are these your defining moments maybe could be a thousand different things let me tell you a quick story about my son jason he is in college at ung and he called me last week and he was going to his uh the christian group there that meets on monday night um uh, it's about 200 kids Kids go to that, and so he was there just talking ahead of time before the lesson started, and he ran into a guy who was in his psychology class in his first semester there on campus, and um, he was like, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. First time you've ever been here, and he's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, this is the first time me and my girlfriend have come to this, and he's like, well, so what brought you here? And he said, he said, you. And he went, what, me? He said, yeah, we were in psychology class, and we were talking about the discussion for the day, and you started talking about Jesus, you started talking about the Bible, you started talking about church, and how important that was, and that there was really truth out there, and, um, and, and he said, that stuck with me. Yeah. He said, I've been thinking about that for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, and we finally decided to come to, 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 to this group, and we started going to church together. My girlfriend and I started going to church. And I'm like, Jason, that's amazing. I said, I told him, I said, this is why you were at UNG. Mm -hmm. This is why God sent you from Conyers to UNG to have a
have a defining moment in that guy's life. Mm -hmm. Now, and I was like, he didn't have to be the one who had a differing opinion in the discussion group. He didn't. He didn't have to speak up. He could have just sat there and listened to everybody talk, but he decided to speak up. And his words mattered in this guy's life. Eternal words, eternal impact in his life. So, you see, you don't know what hangs in the balance of your decisions to be quiet or your decisions to speak up, right? Mm -hmm. And God was really gracious to Jason because usually we don't get to see those. We usually, you just speak and you never know if your words had any impact at all. And I thought that was a really sweet thing that God gave to him to show him and encourage him like that. And that's the reminder to us. Even when we don't see, it doesn't mean there isn't any impact. So we have to be, trust that what God says, that his word doesn't come back void. So are you the one that God put in a specific place for a specific person, purpose? Are you positioned where you are for such a time as this? The answer is yes. You are positioned for such a time as this. Then we don't have D Dale Moody or Amy Carmichael or... Billy Graham or Charles Spurgeon or anybody like that anymore. They're not, they're off the scene. They played their part in their time. But this world in our time has you. He puts you here for a reason. God positioned you here because you have something to bring it to the table. Even with all your faults and your failures and the messy life and all the things that you go, God can never use me because of that. You are here for his purposes. Is it all dependent on you? No. Mordecai told Esther, said, hey, if you don't do it, God will get it done some other way. And that's true for you too. But you know what? We are the ones who miss out when we won't live lives of faithfulness. And we will regret it one day. And here's the takeaway from all of this. God, she could not see what God was up to through her submission and obedience neither can you. We see only in a linear way like this. But God sees it all. He sees it from the beginning to the end. And he allows things in our lives, even things that we don't plan, things that we don't like, things that we, we don't understand. But he is up to something good. And we can trust him even when we can't see. We, and we believe, not because we feel it, not because those you know, feelings are deceptive. They're going to lead you in all kinds of different ways. We believe it because he said it in his word. That's why it's hugely important, important that we learn to frame our disappointments, tragedies, and heartaches with eternity in mind. We can say, God, I don't understand. I don't like it. I wish it was different. I wish you would change this. But in the end, I trust that you have a plan, and then we do exactly as Esther did in this story, that is submit to it and play our part. No matter how it turns out. Give your pain and your disappointment and your fears to Jesus and let him do something amazing with it. He is a master at doing that. And you're probably not going to end up influencing a nation like Esther did, but you might influence one person like Jason. And that's it. And maybe then maybe they influence somebody else who influences somebody else who influences somebody else. That's the principle of multiplication. And that's the way he works. And so when we get disappointed and things don't turn out the way we want to, learn to lean toward God and not away from him. Believe that he is with you. Believe that he has a purpose in the midst of the fear and in the disappointment. And also in the same time, learn to ask some better questions, okay? Instead of asking why God, let's ask God what now. What now, God? Not just why. Instead of, God, why don't you love me, God? What can I learn from you, God? Teach me something in this. Help me see something about you. Help me see something about me. Give, uh, give yourself to learn what he's trying to teach you through our pain and our disappointment. And alongside of the prayer that we like to pray the most, that is God changed this thing, it's okay to pray that. It is completely fine to pray God changed this. But alongside of that, let's pray, will you change me, God? Mm -hmm. Will you change me? See, that's what the world is looking for. Not perfect people with perfect lives, but they are looking for people who have hope in the midst of hopelessness, who have purpose in the midst 
of pain and who have faith in the midst of fear. So, as we adjust our visions to set our eyes on things above and not earthly things, then we face whatever comes our way, big or small, with a willing to, a willingness to, if necessary, lose everything for Christ, knowing that Christ gave up everything to redeem us. So, defining moment. Forks in the road. We're all going to have them. Might be today, might be next week, next month. You just don't know when they're going to happen. That's why it's essential for us. It's a two-word takeaway. We have one word last week, two words this week. Choose faithfulness. Choose faithfulness. Today, you know, sometimes we really make a walk of faith, uh, what a walk of faith and what living in faith, that we make it more complicated than it is. You know, it's like we've got to go to class and we've got to have an outline and we've got to this. And this is what it means to walk of faith, what it means to live by faith. But mostly, a walk of faith and living by faith is just determining in your heart and mind to believe. I will believe God is with me, even though all the evidence in my life says it's not. Just like Mordecai did, right? He didn't have any reason to believe God was working on their behalf. He hadn't seen God move, no prophet, no nothing had happened in Persia for a very, very long time, but he believed anyway. I will believe that God has a purpose in what I'm experiencing, even though it seems, seems like random, purposelessness. But God says he has a purpose, so I will believe. Or I believe that there's more going on here than I can see. Because we only can see a little bit, but God sees it all. And he says that his ways are higher than our ways. And we can trust that he is doing something, even when we can't see but a little bit of the story. That's what it means to walk by faith, choosing to believe. And so we must practice telling ourselves the truth, and we learn the truth by reading the scriptures, right? And then once we know the truth and tell ourselves the truth, then the next thing is to step out and act on the truth, regardless of fear, regardless of our fears. So today, choose faithfulness. Tomorrow, choose faithfulness. In the big, obvious moments that come your way, choose faithfulness. And in the quiet moments of your heart, when no one is looking, when no one is, here's what, we, what you allow your mind to rest on, what your mind heart to ruminate around, what you allow in your screens, all of that, choose faithfulness. Because it matters. It matters what you do when no one else is looking. Okay? When your heart is set on Christ and what he did for you on the cross, then you're able to take up your cross and follow him no matter where he leads in whatever the defining moment holds. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that uh, you wrote it down for us. And we don't have to just remember it in that uh, you gave us your word that you can uh, teach us to walk in faithfulness, to teach us to walk in faith. And God, Remind us that there are things out there that you have made us for. Those moments out there that you have made for us to step into. God, give us the willingness to follow you wherever you lead. Into fearful situations, into confident situations. But help us to lean on your Holy Spirit. Help us to be led by your word. Help us to be led by you wherever you lead us, God. So that we can make an impact and people can know you and come to trust your son as their Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, can I say this? A, a movie is coming out, and it's a God movie. It's a Jesus exalted movie. It's a faith and a testimony of lives being saved. And it's next weekend, the 24th and 25th, and maybe the 22nd, that's a Wednesday though. But since we don't have this, um, I know it's in Conyers. I don't know all the theaters, but I know some are sold out. It's called Jesus Revolution, and it's Greg Glory, and it's his and his wife's life testimony. So it looks great. It's going to be awesome, and I've heard wonderful things. Well, thank you, Leah. Yep. There's something to do. If you, if you want something to do next Wednesday on, 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 on winter break, there you go.